Let's take our Bibles and turn to Amos chapter number 9. Amos chapter number 9. We'll read one verse. You say, where do you get Hispanic immigration and assimilation from in the Bible? you have a verse for that? (laughs) Well, I think I found one. I think there's a lot of verses that will help us understand uh, what is happening in this world. And wow, it is great. And uh, I'm just excited about what the Lord is doing in the United States of America. Uh, with the Hispanic uh, people, and it's just not the Hispanics, but they are the largest minority in our country, so they're the ones that are standing out everywhere, you know. But in Amos chapter number 9, and verse 7, if you understand the book of Amos, it is uh, a message uh, explaining really why the judgment of God is coming upon the nation of Israel. And in Amos chapter 9, verse 7, there's some interesting words that Amos gives uh, to Israel. He says, Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? saith the Lord. Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Syrians from Ker? Now, to understand this verse... God is literally telling Israel, you are no better in my eyes than the heathen nations. You can imagine Israel. God uh, called a man, Abraham, and from his family birthed the nation. And God had a specific plan and purpose for the nation of Israel. He wanted them to migrate from Egyptian bondage to a key geographical location. So as he gave them his laws and revealed himself to them, they could become uh, witnesses to the entire world. But now because of their sin and disobedience, God tells them, all the work that I've done in migrating you for this great purpose, now you're no use to me. You're just as the Ethiopians. It just says, just like a, a heathen nation. But I'm the one true God. And then God goes on to tell us in his word in verse 7, Seth the Lord, Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Syrians from Ker? The point I want to make here is that God is in sovereign control of the migrating people in order to achieve His purpose of world evangelism. I really believe, as the Bible says, chosen in Him. And what I want to get is that uh, world evangelism begins in the heart of God. Amen? It continues with God and it's going to culminate with God one day with the redeemed from every kindred, tongue, and nation and people singing praises to Him around His throne. Amen? And so the Lord is working in our world and behind all of the secondary causes in this world we have to look at God's great purpose. Now, I really believe uh, from this Bible verse that God is the one involved in allowing the migration of Hispanic peoples to the United States of America. Now, I want to just give you three words, and I'm going to try to uh, give you this idea on a global scale. But you will take this, and you can do these uh, three things uh, where your local church is. All right? The first word uh, is assessment. Assessment. I really believe the first thing we need to do is realize God is working. Amen? And we need to come and see what God is doing and what God has commanded us to do in His Word. And we need to make assessment of this. We need to pray so that we're in line with what God is doing in this world. Now, first I want to explain the shifts in the centers of Christianity in the world. I shared this other morning when I preached, but uh, this is from the Pew Research, January the 5th, 2012. It says more than 200 countries find that there are 2.18 billion people that say they're Christians. 37% of all the people that say they're Christians live in the Americas. That's from Alaska all the way down to Argentina. And so 26% of them now live in Europe. 13% live in Asia and 24% live in Sub-Saharan Africa. 100 years ago, Two-thirds of the people that said they were Christians lived in Europe, and almost the other third lived in the United States of America. There was only about 2 billion people. Today there's 7 billion people. And there's still one-third of the world's population that say they're Christians. So you go from 2 billion to 7 billion, and still yet there's one-third of the population that say they're Christians. But the big difference is now these people are spread out around the globe. God is really working. 
And so we look at that and we understand these shifts in global Christianity. You have to take into account God is taking out of this world of people for his name. Now, secondly, I want you to understand in this assessment, we're just making an assessment what God is doing. Uh, I want to show you that global migration is a reality. Uh, some people want to say, well, I'm just going to ignore this. You can't ignore it. The United Nations say that there are almost two uh, million, 200 million people migrating at any time in this world. And uh, basically for, because of uh, war and food. War and food. Now to understand this, God is behind this because he's moving around, he moved around the Philistines. <laughs> he, he moved around the Ethiopians. Uh, he, he, he moved the Syrians and he moved Israel. He's involved in this. You have to understand that. And if God is doing that, he's still doing it in our world today because he has a divine purpose to reveal himself so that his glory will fill this world. Amen? And uh, so we understand that it is a re reality, but it is also we understand it's a human response. I mean, if you're in a war zone and you got a chance to go somewhere else where there's no war, you may do that. You know, look what's happening in Syria at this time. And if you're in a place where there's no food, you know, maybe you'd go somewhere where there's some food. So you have to look at there's a human response involved, but the Lord is behind that, allowing that. And uh, so we understand that it is a reality. In other words, Hispanic migration to the United States of America uh, is just not a localized problem in the globe. Migration is a global issue, and we have to see it that way. So what we understand by making an assessment like this, we're actually uh, looking a little bit broader in the world and putting that uh, Hispanic migration in the context of what's globally taking place. But thirdly now, we get a little bit uh, more honed in uh, to examine the reality of the Hispanic migration to the United States of America. Th uh, there are 50 million Hispanics that live in the United States of America. One in every six people in America is Hispanic. Now, I use the word Hispanic. It's a common word. Some say Spanish-speaking. Uh, some say Latino. But his, if you study the history of the word Hispanic, the United States Bureau of, uh, of uh, Census, the Census Bureau, used that word. And it's just a commonplace word. I just used that. A lot of activists want to use the word Latino. And uh, Spanish speaking is another way to designate. We'll just stay with Hispanic. One in every six people in America is Hispanic. One in every five teens, uh, teenagers in the United States, is Hispanic. One in every two teens in Los Angeles is Hispanic. 70% of the Hispanics in America are Spanish dominant or bilingual. That means 30% of the Hispanics in this nation, 30% of 50 million Hispanics, only speak Spanish. 27% of the Hispanic children in America live in extreme poverty. 12 million Hispanics in America are estimated to be in violation of immigration law. The average age of a non-Hispanic in America is 45 years old. The average age of a Hispanic in America is 27 years old. They're younger. Uh, this uh, Hispanic migration is bringing a great amount of young people to our nation. 46% of Hispanic population in America is under the age of 25. The area that is seeing the fastest growth in Hispanic population is the southeast. <laughs> All right. Now in the southeast, south, salsa now outsells ketchup. Gloria Estefan outsells Fergie. Enrique Iglesia outsells Jay-Z. Tortillas outsell bread. Hispanics have $862 billion in disposable income in this nation. They would be considered the 18th largest economy in the world. Hispanics in America outspend non-Hispanics on electronics, movies, clothes, beauty products, video games, CDs, and groceries. Only Mexico, out of 29 Spanish-speaking countries, only Mexico, with a population of 112 million, has a larger Hispanic population than the United States. We are the second largest Hispanic country in the world. There are four states in which one in five residents speak Spanish. Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas. 
Only 62% of Hispanics in America have a high school diploma. Only 13% of Hispanics in America over the age of 25 have a bachelor's degree. Around 23.2% of elementary and high school students in America are Hispanic. Only 6.2% of Hispanics over 25 years of age are full-time college students. 67.8% of Hispanics in America over the age of 16 are in the civilian labor force. That means that you have a great labor force that does not have a basis of education. Most of them are involved in service type jobs. 19% of Hispanics in America work in management, business, science, and arts. There's 79,440 chief executives in America that are Hispanic. There are 50,866 physicians and surgeons in America that are Hispanic. There are 48,720 post-secondary teachers in America that are Hispanic. There are 38,532 lawyers in America that are Hispanic. There are 2,727 news analysts, reporters, and correspondents in America that are Hispanic. There are 9.7 million Hispanics that are voting now, and they represent the largest minority in the United States. Hispanic Her Heritage Month begins on September the 15th. Now, what do we see from this assessment? These statistics show a great door for reaching the Hispanics with the gospel and evangelizing the world. By the year 2042, we're in 2013, 30 to 40 years from now, it is projected because of birth rate and because of migration, there will be 100 million Hispanics in the United States of America. That means one out of every four people living in this country will be Hispanic. The projected Hispanic growth rate is 167% compared to the non-Hispanic growth, which would be at 1%. Now, these, this is the assessment. Who did it? My point is, God did it. God did it. Now, if we understand that, uh, we're going to understand something that's very important for us here. The second word that you're going to have to do, not only, I'm speaking globally, but we're going to bring a little bit lower now, and you would want to do this in your church. If you have a burden for America... Notice I did not say, if you have a burden for Hispanic people. I said, if you have a burden for America. <laughs> Notice I did not say, if you have a burden for Spanish-speaking people. No, I didn't say that. I said, if you have a burden for your country, the United States of America, then the second thing you're going to have to understand, not just the assessment of where you are, uh, where the Hispanics in your area are from, uh, if they're... That depends on uh, their culture. Uh, it could depend on what will happen in the future. Uh, maybe they're just migrant workers that come through and you just want to try to just evangelize them as they come and go and get them in churches in other parts of the nation. Uh, maybe uh, th uh, there's a large group. Maybe it's predominant Hispanic where you have immigrants coming in, second and third generation and people that have been there. Maybe it would be the indigenous Hispanics that have been here. Uh, since the American uh, uh, Spanish War, you know. So uh, it depends on your assessment, okay? But God is doing something. But the second thing you have to work at is attitude. Attitude. Now, I, I have pretty good eyesight. Last week I went to uh, West Virginia. Uh, got back home from Venezuela to West Virginia to renew my driver's license and had no problem whatsoever. I looked in the, the uh, eye examination machine, whatever that's called, and looked through there and read the letters without any problem. But I do have stigmatism, and I have glasses. And at night, I've realized when I'm driving at night, if I put those glasses on, I really can see the signs better. And I see things a whole lot more clearer. Now... What I want to do in this part when I speak about the attitude is, is that I want you to understand as Christians uh, we need to have a certain pair of glasses on because we're Christians. We're people of God. We're Bible believers. We're disciples of God. And so when I'm speaking about attitude, I'm really speaking about using God's Word as our lenses. You know, we see Hispanics in this nation. It's so obvious. 
Uh, we see the results of our presidential election. The Hispanic thumbprint is there. Uh, we see them working in service jobs and restaurants and working in landscaping. We see them. We walk out and see them. Uh, we see them, thousands and thousands now, are in key leadership positions in our country. Senators, uh, governors, uh, congressmen. And uh, very soon uh, there will be a president, Hispanic president. Now, what I'm trying to say is, how are, what glasses are you going to use to see this with? <laughs> are you going to use the Republican glasses? I hope you won't. Democratic glasses? A political glass? No, you understand what I'm saying. Hey, we need to get back to God's Word, look at this through God's Word, and use God's Word to see what's going on. And uh, that's going to help our attitude. We must approach immigration using the lenses of Scripture. If Christians want to address the problems posed by immigration of Hispanic peoples and contribute, and we should be doing this, we should be talking about it and contributing to this through the lenses of Scripture, then they need to do so consciously as Christians and as biblically informed Christians. Okay? Uh, we understand God's heart in Scripture is for the vulnerable, the foreigner, okay, the outsider. Now, just, I wish I could take time, and uh, I'm going to give you about three minutes here to get to the last part, the last word. But let's just go through this. There's so many wonderful things in the Bible that help us, helps us have the right lens. Compare the Egyptian values with God's values. God, in His plan for 400 years, took them to Egypt. He wanted to teach them something, the nation of Israel. For 430 years, they lived with a set of values. Uh, and these values in Egypt was because of the laws that Egypt had. And because of the laws of Egypt, there were certain values or certain uh, things that were considered important in Egypt. Number one, Pharaoh was king. That was not to be doubted in Egypt. And the Israelites living under this slavery, uh, they knew that value, Pharaoh is king. The poor were mistreated, they were beaten, they were enslaved. And the strangers that came, the foreigners that came, were made slaves. And that was the Egyptian value. But when God took His people out of Egyptian bondage, God gave His people a new law. It was God's law. And God's law shows God's heart and shows God's values. See, that was the whole purpose of the nation of Israel. They were to be a particular people, God's people, with God's laws. And in obeying God's law, other nations would see the difference and would be testified or receive testimony of God's glory. Do you see that? But God's laws were the exact opposite of Egyptian law. Therefore, God's values were, holy, were completely different than the Egyptian values. God's values, Jehovah was king, amen? The poor were taken care of, and the stranger was always welcomed. You know, there's three ways you can treat foreigners. Neutrally, negatively, or welcoming. And the only thing you want to get through the lens of Scripture is welcoming. That's it. If you use another lens, you may be neutral, you may be negative, but if you only use the Bible, you will be welcoming. Okay? Now, I wish I could take a few more minutes to uh, speak about that. And I have a lot of information, but uh, just a sojourner. I'm going to do it. Just give me a couple of minutes here. You know what Pastor Sexton said? He said... Uh, he didn't want to be the boss of anyone, so if you take that to the next step, it means no one should be your boss, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we'll take a few more minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Erase that. No one's recording this, are they? You get me in trouble. No, just very quick. I'm just going to speak quick, and we're going to get out on time because I know we want to get to the next classes. But just a few things about the assimilation of the sojourner. God's law for the foreigners, it was the exact opposite of what they lived in Egypt. First, the sojourner had to be assimilated in religion. 
They were permitted to participate in the Sabbath, the Day of Atonement, the Passover, the Feast of the Weeks, the Feast of the Tabernacles, the First Fruits. They also could have forgiveness for in, in unintentional sin and access to the cities of refuge. Number two, the sojourner was assimilated in language. They were to be present at the periodic reading of the law where they would be learning what it meant to be a member of society and showing their solidarity with Israel and Israel's acceptance of them. They were to be assimilated in the legal responsibility. They were subject to penalties of criminal law. They had to follow dietary restrictions, sexual taboos, purity laws, regulation, and feast, and were prohibited against the worship of other gods and blasphemy against the Lord. And they were assimilated into the distinction of being bicultural. They could keep their culture. They were dietary laws that did not apply to sojourners. Sometimes the rule uh, uh, did not let foreigners participate in the sanctuary was ignored. Solomon prayed, hey, I want the foreigners to come and worship in our sanctuary. You know, it's an amazing thing when we look that God's law changed values. It changed values. And sad to say, if you go back to your great grandfather or your great great grandfather you know what <laughs> he immigrated here as well right it is a fabric of our nation to receive and assimilate immigrants okay 300 years the hispanic people have been were colonized under spanish rule and subjugated to uh, false religion of the of catholicism and then for the last 200 years, most of them have just been under the most horrible dictatorships and corruption and injustice you could ever imagine. And I guarantee anyone in here that has been under that for generations of over 500 years, you would make a run for it, okay? Hey, they left Europe for freedom, and God was in it. And I really believe with all my heart, if we look at this, through the lenses of Scripture, God is just as much as in the German immigration, the, the, uh, the Irish, the Jews that came. Hey, St. Patrick's Day, where'd that come from? <laughs> the Irish. And it's now, it's time for the Hispanics to be assimilated into our nation. It is their time. For 150 years, there's been Hispanic migration to our nation. But it is now the time that has came and we have to understand this to the lens, the attitude, okay? How Jesus dealt with the Samaritans. This shows us more of God's heart, our attitude that has to change. There was a higher commitment. He said, give me a drink of water. That was against the culture. He healed a Samaritan leper. And he was embraced and worshipped by him. He used a Samaritan for an illustration in Luke 10 to teach a scribe who was his neighbor. And when it got down to it, Jesus said, who was the one that showed compassion on him? And he couldn't say the Samaritan. He just said, the one that showed mercy. Isn't it amazing, our Lord's heart? With God's attitude, we can think correctly about the immigration problems. What is to be done with the undocumented immigrants who are already here is one thing, and to handle future immigration is another. Listen very closely as we think about this through the lens of Scripture and logic. The immigration problem is heightened because of immigrants being here illegally. Decades of lax enforcement, there has not been any enforcement of immigration law, uh, Completely, there's some more just border control, and there has not been any laws passed in over 20 years that has uh, effectively helped the, immig the Hispanic immigration in our nation. So, because of the lax enforcement of our laws and desperate circumstances in parts of Mexico and Latin America, no solution is going to be perfect. What is to be done uh, with the undocumented is one thing the undocumented at this moment and future is something different. Now here's the other things you think logically about this. It is unrealistic to think that the U.S. will use the military, and they would have to do it, the National Guard or on up, to deport 12 million Hispanics that are here undocumentedly, or to build a wall across the border and shoot those that climb across the border. 
The U.S. is not a nation that could commit such acts in today's world. And by the way, they always say, you hear this everywhere, they need to get in the back of the line. What line? <laughs> I mean, have you read immigration law? I mean, if there is a line, you can just go get in voluntarily and come here. It has to be because you're investing in this nation. And they don't have the money to invest. They're not invested in this nation. So that, that, that just doesn't work. I understand what people are saying. They're trying to, we're trying to be just about that. But number three, listen to this, to grant blanket amnesty to illegal people, undocumented people, would be to reward the lawbreaker. Okay? Now, I do not include the children and the babies that were brought across the border as illegal. That's why I prefer the term undocumented. They didn't have a choice about it, but they came here. They have no documentation. They've grown up in our school system. Some of them can go to colleges, and they're undocumented. Okay? Millions. But it would also uh, be um, discouraging the law-abiding citizens of our nation, and it would also encourage illegal more illegal immigration. Now, we're just thinking logically. So we understand that uh, blanket deportation will not work. <laughs> There's no way. And now we're understanding that uh, blanket amnesty will not work either. And that's why it's so hard for our government to react. Oh, wow. Well. But anyway, so what should we do? There's one option. And uh, that's assimilation. There is a reservoir of goodwill on part of the American public. The outcry is called, and there's no outcry calling for mass deportation. Uh, there's no real support to criminalize, criminalize the undocumented immigrants that are here. And it's, we understand the reason why they were here is because of the food issue. Third word, I got just a few seconds, assimilation. We made the assessment globally. And from Scripture, we see God's hand is in that for world evangelism. Then we understand, wow, not only our attitudes need to change, but Hispanic attitudes need to change. They need to take the responsibilities to be citizens of the United States of America, not to get handouts from some bureaucratic government leaders so they can win their vote to stay in power. So there's an attitudinal change that needs to take place, but that'll take place through the lenses of Scripture. Amen? But the idea is assimilation, and this is the heart of it all. It's not an easy thing to get, to get in in about 25 minutes. One church. There's no, no need for two churches. There's no need in America today to go start a Spanish-speaking ministry. There's no need to start a Spanish-speaking church or have a Hispanic ministry, Hispanic church. There are certain places in this nation where it will be great to be bilingual, have a bilingual pastor. But if he just has Spanish-speaking people, sooner or later he's going to have to go out and reach English-speaking people and make sure they can sit in his pew or he can't follow the Great Commission. And then the English-speaking people that have five, 600 Spanish people in a building somewhere and have what they say Spanish church or Spanish-speaking church there, then think of the children and think of their grandchildren that are having the doors of opportunity of this nation closed upon them. But here's the, here's the whole point right here. They need to be in the church that is. There's thousands of Hispanic leaders in our nation. We're going to have a Hispanic president in this nation. They need to be in the choir singing. They need to be uh, uh, deacons in the church. They need to be reached with the gospel and assimilated in our churches. What is the only institution in this nation that could handle the mass assimilation necessary if, if God would work to touch the heart of the kings in this nation so that the door of Hispanic immigration would enter? Let me give you the six E's and we're out of here. Enforcement, only the government can do that. Evangelism, the church can do that. English, the church can do that. Education, which means teaching them what it means to be an American. The church can do that. Employment, we don't want them to become wards of the state, do we? No, we want them to contribute to our nation. Okay, that's part of being a, a, an American. We, the church can help them with employment. And then entrance, the church can help communicate the policy necessary for them to become American citizens. Now, I, what I did, because of the time we had, 
I probably call, uh, made you think a little bit, and you probably have a bunch of questions that, I, <laughs> that we have no time to answer. But, praise the Lord. <laughs> One small step, amen. Father, take what we've shared, use it. Lord, so many great things that you're doing in this world. Uh, Lord, help us now to understand what you're doing in our nation. And Lord, we don't need two Americas. And uh, Lord, 2,000 years ago, Lord, the middle wall was broken down between Greeks and Jews. And they came together. And Lord, you're going to do something great through this effort. And Lord, help us understand that. Give us your understanding of it in Jesus' name. Amen.